So thank you, Alexei, and thank you all for being here. Um, I, for one, think that reinforcement learning is one of the exciting and promising uh, fields of uh, machine learning right now. Uh, and um, following uh, Jan's great introduction, I'm gonna reinforce that, if you'll excuse a bad joke, and uh, dive into a bit more detail uh, about reinforcement learning. So we're gonna talk about a few basic concepts um, in a bit more detail, but foremost, reinforcement learning is about sequential decision making. So if we think about recent uh, success stories and uh, areas of interest in machine learning, we have uh, face recognition, we have translation, uh, speech, um, all examples of non-sequential tasks um, in the sense that their solution is a component in a processing pipeline from inputs to outputs that does not directly get feedback um, on, on, on its uh, outputs. Uh, by contrast, <laughs> systems like uh, robotics, uh, uh, dialogue systems, and uh, infrastructure management are inherently interactive. Um, so they, they are uh, sequential decision-making problems um, where an agent is operating uh, with its environment, um, so it's machine learning that is live, online, uh, real time, and where the agent is interacting with its very own source of data. Um, so let's take a simple example. So here we have a, a system that's essentially this uh, drone thing, which we'll call an agent, interacting with its environment, uh, so navigating this maze to get to some interesting states, good states. For example, uh, this state marked by, by the coin where there's, let's say, some object of interest to pick up. Um, so we can talk about the state of the system. In this case, it's the agent's location. S for state, T for time. So it's a state at time T. Um, and we can talk about the action, which is sort of the uh, intended direction where the agent wants to move. Um, AT, and I say intended because that's not always what's gonna happen. That's sort of the, the control signal. That's sort of what the agent is trying to do. Um, and we, we uh, very essentially are gonna talk about rewards. So that's the reinforcement signal. The reward signal, RT, uh, and, and it marks some sort of uh, um, score for, for the action we just took. Is it good, is it bad, very locally? For example, in this case, we can get a prize for reaching our target. We could get a huge cost for hitting the wall. Um, so a, a cost is a negative reward. To formalize this just a bit, uh, we're talking about marker decision processes. Uh, and and it's, uh, this is a probabilistic model whose output is this concept of, uh, of trajectory. Do I have a pointer? this concept of trajectory, which is a sequence of states, actions, and rewards. Um, and, and in this sequence, uh, we have the probability of a trajectory determined by, uh, by each step. So, uh, oh, thank you. Yeah, so, so each variable here is gonna be determined by its predecessors in the sequence. So uh, for example, the state is determined by the current state and the, and the action taken, they determine the next state. For example, if we start here at the initial state and we take the action move left, then with very high probability, P, uh, the probability of the next state, given this state and the action move left, we're gonna end up in this state to the left. I say with high probability because there's always some surprises. Maybe there's wind, maybe there's some unexpected obstacle. So there's always some probability of getting to some other state that, that we didn't expect. Um, so this is the state dynamics and that's sort of the uh, problem domain. That's, that's sort of given to us. Maybe we know it, maybe we don't, but we don't get to, uh, to set this uh, dynamics. We do get to control the state, and the way we do it is by choosing a policy. We choose how to react to the state. So a policy could be deterministic. So given a state, 
We, it's just a function of the state, we call it pi, that gives us the action to take next. Or it could be a stochastic policy, where we have some probability distribution over the next action, given the current state. And finally, we have a reward, which is just a function of the action we took in the state we took it. How good is it locally? So what does it mean to have a policy? How do we use a policy? So we have this environment that we behave in, and we have our agent policy, and we roll it out in this following sense. So we reset the environment. We start in some initial state, let's say that, that state. Then given that state, we choose our next action. Um, let's say move left. And then we take a step in the environment by supplying that state, applying that state to the environment, which does two things. It gets us the reward for that immediate action. And then it gets us to the next state according to some probability distribution. In this case, it was locally a success. We moved to the state we intended. Um, and then in this next state, we do this again. We uh, apply our policy, which gives us the next action, which we apply in the environment to get another reward signal to the next state, and so on and so forth, until maybe an episode terminates or maybe just an ongoing task. Um, we're mostly going to be talking about episodic scenarios where there's an initial state, there's a final state, um, and, and then the episode is over. So let's, uh, let's consider some examples. This is a really a very broad, very uh, general setting where a lot, of, a lot of problems fit into this. There's, there's the question of how to model a, a specific problem to fit into this uh, setting and whether it makes sense. So a lot of them do make sense. Recently, famously, uh, uh, the game of Go was won using, uh, in part, reinforcement learning. And to model this game, uh, we can say that the state of the game is just what we see on the board. And an action is, is just a Go move, which is to place a stone somewhere on the board. And the reward uh, is what we get to capture with this uh, action. Now remember, this is not winning the game. This is not about the end result. This is just about the local information of, did, does it seem like I did something good or bad? Of course, it accumulates. And then in the end, we tally all the captures and determine who won the game. Now, this, uh, this environment is sort of unique. Uh, and a lot of success stories in reinforcement learning have been unique in the sense that uh, the environment can be simulated. And this is very important, particularly <laughs> Uh, in the game of Go where we sort of need a, an opponent. So billions of, uh, of games were self-played between uh, the learned agent and a copy of itself until finally uh, about a year ago it won uh, against the second world ranker and recently the, the first. Another example uh, which is very exciting is autonomous vehicles where um, um, so again, let's, let's try to model this as a reinforcement learning problem. Although most approaches currently are not reinforcement learning, um, but, but, but reinforcement learning does have a part in this. So we can think of the state as everything captured by our sensors. We get to see the environment, we, get to, we have cameras. Mo, mo, very importantly, we have GPS. This is a l very large component of what we know about the environment. Where are we? And that tells us a lot because we have databases, tells us a lot about what we should expect in our vicinity. The action is, is the control of the car. Just whatever you do when you drive. You steer, you accelerate, you decelerate. And the reward is maybe you, you want to get fast to where you're going. You want to get there and not somewhere else. But very importantly, there's constraint satisfaction here. There's safety constraints that must, must be satisfied. And there's huge costs for crashing the car, for hurting someone. So that's, that's a huge part of the reward. Now this environment is physical. Uh, you can simulate it, but it's not going to be the same thing. And that's, that's, very, that's key here, because physical environments are harder to learn in, because, uh, because rolling out in them 
is, is takes more time and can be, done, can be done fewer times, and resetting is not always an option. Uh, for example, after a crash, you don't get a reset. Um, another example with a physical environment is surgical robots. Uh, so again, you have your sensors, which tell you the state of the environment. You have the endoscopes. And importantly, you have joint angles of, of the robot itself. And the change in that joint angles is what you, uh, what you control, what you are trying to set for the next state. Now here, usually, there's no good reward signal. You can wait for the episode to end, the surgery to end, or whatever subtask you were doing, and then ask, is this successful? And this is a very sparse reward. This is very hard to learn from. Um, and it may also be hard to specify. How do we know the task was successful? We need some uh, classifier just to recognize whether the task was successful. Maybe we need human feedback. Um, so even in reinforcement learning, where reward was sort of the problem was set so that reward is easy to specify, and learning leveraging it is, is uh, sort of uh, uh, easy to do. Um, Sometimes it's hard to specify the reward. Okay, so let's start with the basic um, goal or the basic uh, uh, task that, that we want to accomplish in reinforcement learning. And that is, given a policy, how good is it uh, compared to other policies maybe? So we are going to define this return. The return is the sum of the rewards over the entire episode. Um, so it's not just a one-step reward like we, we mentioned before. It's the sum of all rewards in our episode. And it's going to be discounted by this exponential discount factor gamma, uh, which serves a number of purposes. But most importantly, uh, it sort of biases us to achieve rewards early. Because if rewards we get late, like in the, in the, in the stock market or, or uh, uh, money, we want to get it uh, sooner, there's going to be inflation, right? And costs, we, we want to get later. So that discount is going to sort of bias us towards that. Um, and the value of our policy is, is the ex expected reward, ex sorry, expected return that it's going to get when we roll it out in the environment. So one way to evaluate a policy is to do just that. And that's one of the things you're going to do in the Ray tutorial today. Uh, so you, we just roll out the policy in the environment a bunch of times. We remember the return that we got, and we average it. And if we run it enough times, the average is going to converge to the expectation, and that's our, the value of our policy right there. So that's one way of doing it. There's others um, um, which I'm not going to get into. By the way, uh, please do ask questions uh, during the talk if there's anything that's not clear. Okay. Yeah. So why are we Yes. Yes, that's a very good question. Um, the question was, why am I only evaluating success? So this particular policy that I roll out here uh, has two modes of success, but it doesn't have failures. There, of course, there could be failures, and I just didn't show them. If there are failures, uh, for example, if it bumps against the wall, gets a negative reward of 100, uh, that's going to go into there as well. Yeah, just didn't show the, those cases. Yes? That is a very good question. So the question was about this game where essentially it's a multi-agent problem. Um, there is another, oh, there's a, an opponent which is another agent. Uh, and do we model that as an agent or do we model that as part of the environment? And that is a, a big research question. Um, so reinforcement learning is not multi-agent. It, it, it essentially works by uh, modeling any other agent is just part of the environment. We know that that's not the optimal thing to do, and there's research into multi-agent aspects as well. Yeah, 
So, right. Yeah. So, so in in this case, there was some initialization from human play, but mostly it was self-play between two copies of the agent. So you play. Sorry. Uh, two copies of the same agent. Yeah. So you play against uh, a previous version of yourself. So you roll it out as part of the environment, both as part of your agent and as part of the, as the environment uh, as the other agent. Yes. Yes, very much so. So reinforcement learning is just the name machine learning people call it. Uh, it's been studied in various forms in a lot of fields. It's been called um, uh, optimal control. It's been called operations research. Um, it's even been studied in uh, behavioral psychology. So it has a, a connection to a lot of fields. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, since the environment itself is dynamic, uh, from a given state, if you take the same action at different times, the outcome would be different. Right? For example, presence of obstacle. It could be different. Yeah. So how is that taken into account when you calculate rewards? Because rewards will also change based on what is present in the environment at a given point in time. So you're right that the stochasticity of the environment is, is a huge factor in estimating uh, in, in, in estimating the behavior. If it was deterministic, we would just need to take the same sequence of actions every time, right? But because it's stochastic, it can surprise us, uh, we need to be able to uh, react to whatever changes happen in the environment. That is right. And it also can increase our variance, and that's something we, we need to control for. Yes. Uh, so the gamma just Gamma discount factor uh, that you uh, showed of present versus future, if you make that extremely low, that makes the learning problem quite like simple. And if it's extremely high, then it becomes intractable. But outside of uh, the implications on how difficult or easy the problem is to solve, uh, what is the ideal way to set gamma from, uh, like how do you think about uh, this gamma factor from a, a problem perspective? That is a very good question. Um, I'd say it's an open research question. Um, it gamma controls the variance uh, and the horizon. But uh, okay, I'm I'm, uh, I'm going to stop this uh, session of, of questions now. We'll do more later. I want to I want to continue, um, with your permission. Um, so yeah, so we talked about. Um, sorry. We talked about the, the value of policy, uh, but now I want to talk about uh, something more nuanced, which is the value function of a policy. And the value function, uh, this Q of S and A, uh, it's a function of the current state and the action I'm taking in that state. And instead of taking the expected return of the entire episode, I'm going to take the expected return given that I am in this state and I am taking this action, what can I expect to follow? What is the expected return I can expect following this? And that kind of gives us a sense of which states are good and which actions are good to take in those states. Um, you see the value function for this uh, domain here. Here I sh I'm showing you for each state the maximum. So if I take the optimal action in that state, what is the return going to be like following that state uh, and the optimal policy later. And this is very useful information to have because if we have this for every uh, state in action, what we can do is we can compute for the, from this um, the optimal policy. So, sorry, if we have this for the, optim for the optimal value, we can compute for this the optimal policy. Um, because we just take the optimal action in every state, right? If this tells us uh, which action is, is how good in each state, we just take the best action. Now, notice that our policy appears on both sides here. So this is sort of a self-consistent equation, but it is satisfied by the optimal policy and 
Moreover, it's only satisfied by the optimum policy. So this is a very good principle to have for optimality. And we're going to use that. This is, uh, if I'm going to show you one equation, it's this one, it's the Bellman equation. Richard Bellman uh, sort of invented dynamic programming to solve such problems uh, some six decades ago. And this is the fundamental equation of, of, this, uh, of this field. So it says that uh, the expected return that I can expect in my future decomposes as the reward that I'm going to get next plus a discount of the expected return that I'm going to get next after the first uh, step, if that makes sense. But we have, uh, we have this for the optimal policy. So uh, we know that if we want to get the optimal return, we need to take the best action in the next state that appears next, that appear best according to my, uh, my evaluation of the value. So this, is, this can be considered a recursion, which I can apply to estimate the optimal return that I can get with any policy. So I can iterate this. I can plug in my estimated Q in the right-hand side, extract it on the left-hand side, and iterate this equation until it converges. And under some conditions, it's guaranteed to converge to the optimal uh, value of the optimal policy. And then if I want to extract the optimal policy, I just take the best action, the action that appears best, according to my estimate of the return. Let me show you how this works on this domain. So it's going to be quick. So uh, what you're going to see here is how uh, the estimate of the return evolves when I run these iterations. So you see that it starts with the goal. When I'm far from the goal, initially I don't know where to go. I don't know that I can get any reward. But it starts from the goal. I know that I can get reward there. And then it propagates back. This is a backward recursion. It propagates back to all the states in the system. Uh, it's sort of like a shortest path problem. That I start from the goal and then I find uh, how best to get to the goal. Um, actually, let me stop here and, uh, and take a few more questions. Yes? So, uh, a question about that. Is there an assumption that the underlying like, system that you are implementing that the reward is stationary, meaning that it doesn't change with time? I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, the question is that, is there any assumptions that the underlying uh, probability matrix, the stochastic uh, uh, probability distribution, does not change with time? Is it stationary? That is an assumption we're making now. You, we, we don't have to make it. But, 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 but let's say if you, let's say if it's changing, you know, time varying, mm -hmm. then you have to learn fast enough, otherwise it's useless, right? Is there any, you know, um, relationship between your learning rate and the change of that the matrix? Is, yes, yes. So uh, uh, right now in, in this equation, for example, I'm assuming that I know the dynamics of the world, so I can compute this. Uh, we don't always assume that. That's a question of model base versus model free learning. And w if we're not assuming uh, that we know the dynamics, so we're mal free, then we need to somehow learn it, and we need to learn it fast enough so that it doesn't change too soon. Yes. So, so, so we're still question. assuming. But we are still assuming that, even though we don't know it, we are assuming that it doesn't ch does not change with time. Is that is that correct? No, we d we don't have to assume that. Um, so it can change with time. I mean, they. It can. So so that that means whatever we learn may already change. Um, after we learn it, right? Yes. So we, we, maybe, we maybe keep chasing a, a moving target in, in that case. Yeah, so we need, we need some assumptions, right? We okay. need to assume something about uh, what we're up against. Uh, and if it is very chaotic, if it's changing all the time, then there's not much hope. But if it's changing slowly enough, then uh, we can learn it, yeah. So uh, when you take the example of self-driving car, there are objects that are stationary also moving. Mm -hmm. So in that case, like how do you treat the discount factor? So the discount factor in, in effect says that uh, things that are far in the future um, are, are not considered as much as things that are close in the future, right? So um, that exactly captures that uncertainty, right? If something is, is moving in the environment in an unpredictable way, that sort of prevents me from planning too far ahead, right? Um, trying to say what the, what the world will look like in, in, in a year 
is, is very futile, right? What the road would look like in five minutes is not very reliable. But in a few seconds, I can make a good prediction. So I, can, I should probably plan for the near future. So I'm discounting any, uh, any idea of what's far in the, into the future and focusing on what's near. And uh, since you mentioned the environment is dynamic, mm -hmm. so h how does that uh, the fit in your assumption, right? You already know this is the pathway. <coughs> I'm going to travel. So, so then yeah. how do you define the reward? The reward in, in uh, autonomous vehicles? Yeah. So uh, first of all, as I mentioned, there's constraints that you have to satisfy. You can, you can, uh, you can uh, try to move quickly forward, you can try to reach your goal. There's a bunch of rewards that you need to design and specifying the reward for, for a given problem. So it's a, it's a hard problem, right? So you, you, have, you have your domain. You, you, you're all gonna go back and, and, and think about the domains you encounter and can I model this as a reinforcement learning problem? Uh, it's not always easy to do and uh, reward shaping is particularly challenging. Um, there's a number of ways to do it. I'm not going to get too much into that. Okay. Thanks. One more, and then uh, and then uh, we can continue. Yeah, someone there. Um, can you give us any insight into why the AlphaGo algorithm didn't use this approach to calculating the action value function? Which approach? Uh, so uh, the Bellman equation. Um, so, first of all, the specific equation I wrote assumes that you know uh, the dynamics of the world. You know how the state is going to change in response to your action. And um, here, we, as we mentioned, part of the environment is your opponent. In, you don't know exactly know what they're going to do, right? You don't have a model of them. And th anyway, they're changing all the time in reaction to your learning. So. Um, you probably can't model your environment. You need to be model free. So that's one difference. All right, so let's, uh, let's move on. Um, I mentioned a, a few other uh, issues of interest. So one is the, is, is the question of representation. So we talked about the value function, but how do we represent it? Usually the state space is huge. Um, Let's think of, the, of Go, for example. The, s the space of all Go states is, is huge. Um, and um, of course, with, uh, with any physical environment, it's continuous, right? It's not going to repeat exactly uh, twice. So how do we represent this function? We need some sort of approximation, uh, which um, uh, we can have with uh, deep representations. Um, and and naturally enough, deep reinforcement learning uh, has really given a boost to, to reinforcement learning. Um, one example, the sort of the first, the classic example by now, is this Q network. So we want to represent this Q function with a neural network where the input is uh, states and actions. But remember that what we really want to do with this in the end is to take the maximum um, over actions. So we want to represent this in a way where, uh, wh where we can do two things. We can compute Q for any given S and A, but also we can compute the value, the optimal value for any given state. We can maximize over the actions. And the architecture uh, proposed in the original paper is this. So we take the state as an, act, as, as, as an input, we pass it through some neural layers, uh, in this case convolutional layers, and as well as some fully connected layers. And in the end we output a vector of the Q function, the Q values, for this state and for all actions. And this is just a long vector over all possible actions in this environment. This works for environments where the number of possible actions is not too large. And then we can uh, easily uh, query this, uh, this vector for any specific Q value, but we can also take the maximum, which allows us to perform value iteration. And that's the basic algorithm behind uh, deep Q learning. Also some other, some other tricks, it's small free. Uh, and finally, uh, I wanted to talk about 
policy-based representations. So this was value-based. Uh, we represent the, the value function, and we can easily extract the policy from it. Well, what if we represent the policy, not the value? Uh, how do we learn then? And I think we're going to have an exercise uh, in the Ray tutorial where you do this sort of policy-based uh, reinforcement learning. It's going to be a, a, an algorithm called policy gradient. But all of them essentially work in this way. Uh, we have a policy that we represent, and we have a loop where we evaluate the policy, at least partially, as we've seen before. And then we use that evaluation to improve the policy. For example, to take a gradient step on that policy. So this, uh, this is essentially all algorithms have this form. Okay. Um, now I'm happy to take more questions. My question is about the complexity of the problem, because uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we have to deal with the stochastic dynamic programming, Bellman equation. So how about the complexity? Because sometimes you have to make a fast decision. So, and maybe your approach is, is not enough fast. That's why we have a multi-agent multi systems or some approach like cellular uh, automata in computer science. So how do you deal with the complexity for stochastic dynamic programming when you have a huge uh, decision space. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So from a theoretical point of view, the computational complexity is huge. It's really uh, um, as, as large as, as you can imagine. Some of these problems are even undecidable. But from a practical perspective, the point is finding uh, efficient algorithms. And usually um, the bottleneck is going to be uh, your representation. So that's why we focus on efficient implementations of, uh, of uh, neural networks, on efficient communication of uh, representations and, and gradients, um, because that's going to be your, uh, your bottleneck. If you can uh, have a huge representation that approximates the function well, every update step is very easy. But then the complexity comes from the size of your representation, essentially. Also, the sample complexity. And the amount of interaction with the environment you need in order to learn is also controlled by the size of your representation. Yes? Uh, <coughs> I have a scope question about Ray. Uh, some of the limitations that I see in the real world of uh, using uh, RL is the ability to capture ongoing knowledge from experts that understand the dynamics of the, the real world problem that you're facing. Is it something you guys are hoping to deal with during... So one hope of uh, reinforcement learning is, is as much as possible to do away with expert knowledge uh, of the domain. Uh, so you can formulate the problem uh, in a very general way and solve it in a very general way. But of course we know that that's not always possible. If you have expert knowledge of your system, you should be able to bake it into your at least representations uh, and sometimes algorithms in order to perform better. Uh, other questions on the, the diagram that you show on the value function. Mm -hmm. um, so that diagrams... Um, the Which one? No, no, the value function, the last few slides. Uh, no, the, the diagrams with the uh, joysticks, a lot of... Oh, yeah. Yeah, this one, this one, right. So in this case, that I, I can see that your state can be continuous, but does it mean that your action has to be discrete in this case? So for this particular representation, the action has to be discrete, yes. There are other representations where it doesn't. Um, but this, this is one example where it is discrete, yes, and small. But if it is continuous, what will be the output looks like in this case? So when it is continuous, for example, uh, you can represent the policy distribution. Right? It's, a, it's a distribution of the action. Let's say it's Gaussian. So you, you can represent it by its uh, parameters. So the output of the network would be the parameters of the uh, distribution, let's say the mean and the... So, so in this case, let's say this is a driving car, and let's say the output is like how the angles that you want to steer the wheels. Yes. So in that case, that would be one output, but that is uh, probability distributions, that you output yeah. a probability distribution of that? Yeah, so, so you'd output the sort of the, the mean of, of, of this narrow uh, Gaussian where you want to aim your, your control. Okay. Right? Okay, thanks. 
there's some interesting priors that you've introduced in your articulation of the problem. Notably, as I would interpret it, the ends justify the means, and it's better to find a solution sooner rather than later. Have you looked at investigating playing with some of your priors in terms of experimental design to see where that would lead? That's a very good question. Um, people are doing that. They sort of uh, uh, do the sensitivity test of their uh, design choices um, to various uh, parameters of the problem. Um, for example, delayed reward. You're looking for reward up front and discounting uh, rewards down the, the mm -hmm. end. So one of the, so one of the um, um, let's say, hyperparameters of, of your algorithm would be the discount. It's not right. something that is, a, that is uh, obvious in the, in the world, but something that you need to choose. And how do you choose it? Well, that's a hyperparameter that you need to tune. And there's a whole field of study of how to tune hyperparameters. Yeah, I'm just walking away with two statements. The means justify the ends and don't delay your gratification. And those two seem to be contrapositive to what we are all trained as children. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so, yeah, you don't want your, your discount to be too high so that you don't consider rewards that are very late uh, in the game. But also there are, um, there are representations I didn't get into uh, um, representation features such as memory that allow you to sort of remember and plan for a longer term. So the name of the game, yes, is long-term planning. Um, I want to trade off my very immediate action, which I care about in, in, machi in machine learning in general. I, I get an image. I want to get give the, the best classification of this image that I can. I'm, I'm not worrying about what's going to happen next week. Um, but in, in reinforcement learning, I do very much care about the long term. Uh, so I need to trade off my short term with the long term. How do I do that? How do I plan for a very long horizon? That's a very hard question. Uh, memory is one of the ways you, can, you deal with that. You sort of need to, a very long, you, know, you need patience. You need to remember that the game is long. Yes? Sorry, go, going back to the solution algorithms and <clears throat> whether you use DP or stochastic DP, I remember many years ago using stochastic DP for multi-reservoir optimization problems. Mm -hmm. If your state space is multidimensional and you know, in, you know, the only choice we had was successive uh, approximation, successive DP, and it, you know, the, there was no proof of convergence and so forth. So are you using same kind of techniques here? You, you're, you're looking for policies and closed closed loop solutions, right, in, in reinforcement learning. And so how do you, ha, has there been innovations in, you know, other areas of uh, neural networks and so forth where you've, you're able to solve this problem now in a better way or, I mean, if, if your state space is single dimensional, it's one thing, but if you have several dimensions, then it becomes a very messy problem, right? Yes, you're very right. So um, the problem gets harder uh, as your, as your, the, essentially the space of your solutions is larger. And the space of the solutions, the policies, gets larger with the size of the input. So if the input is very high dimensional, then uh, you need to process a lot of inputs in every decision you make. Um, and again, the key is representation. Um, I'm, I'm repeating that a lot. I, I, I think representation is key uh, in reinforcement learning. Uh, and it's uh, not a coincidence that as representation um, models um, uh, became better with deep learning, it also gave a huge boost to this field. So the way to deal with the complexity of, uh, of the inputs is, is better representations. Other than that, um, we, are, we are using algorithms that are provably optimal if we didn't have the representation problem. So if we could represent the uh, functions exactly, the algorithms would converge uh, well and provably. But we're not. So um, 
any guarantees are mostly out the window. Thank you very much.